In the years that have passed since my 2014 upload of the setup video covering the original Core 2 Duo MacBook and the 2018 definitive review of the OG Surface Pro, the silent question of what exactly a combination of these two devices might look like has been festering in my mind as well as those of the viewers. Well, today I can finally put all of that to rest with this decade's entry into the Apple Portable Computing Video category. This is the MacBook Pro. I'll pick this up and check this out. Some people seem to believe that it's necessary to treat Apple products with kid gloves or give them special handicap points in reviews and commentaries, as evidenced by my bombshell Power Mac G5 FAQ video originally published back in 2014. In fact, if you need any proof that I'm never going to present the viewers with anything but the objective truth, that controversial video represents the genesis of this long-standing policy. With that said, however, unlike the G5, the Circa 2012 MacBook Pro is actually a fairly pleasant and powerful computer in practice. Apple saw the value early on in ditching the optical drive as a means to save a significant amount of space inside the machine. And what we're left with is a computer equipped with a heavy hitting quad core third generation i7 processor and a NVIDIA GeForce GT 650M, along with eight gigabytes of memory welded to the board and a PC that's less than three quarters of an inch thick and weighs in at under four and a half pounds, all while packing an 87 watt hour battery. For a 15 inch notebook, that's just flat out impressive. As longtime viewers of the channel will remember, I own a 17 inch Dell Precision M6400 laptop, which is a true professional grade portable. And while that's been a great computer, the video card is showing signs of failure. But more to the point, that masterpiece of a system is a nine pound beast. In fact, the most recent Ultrabooks I've owned are only a little lighter than this MacBook Pro. So such a PC could theoretically stand in as a replacement for both a full laptop and Ultrabook especially with the promise of switchable graphics technology. So in that case, the only question is, what could Apple possibly do to ruin such a combination? Before I cover Apple's incompetence, and don't worry, there'll be plenty to talk about, let's take a quick hardware tour. The computer's casing, unlike the non-pro MacBook, is an aluminum material. There is an apple-shaped cutout on the back so that people on the other side of the screen can know that it's on, but there is no actual power or indicators of any kind any place else on the computer's casing. At least the 2006 model had a little light on the front to let you know when the computer was on while the display was off but this one doesn't. While the screen does sport a 16-10 aspect ratio and high resolution, it does have a glossy finish, which is another one of those small annoyances. Speaking of small annoyances, I am going to talk about this idiocy on the keyboard here in a bit, but credit where credit is due, Apple was one of the only mainstream companies, if not the only, with enough clout back in 2012 to convince LG or whoever was making display panels to build them a non-16-9 laptop screen. ThinkPads, Latitudes, ProBooks, and all consumer level portables, by this point in time, as far as I know, seemed to be stuck in the desert of 16.9 LCDs. And I'll leave it to the peanut gallery to decide if this computer is actually worthy of the Pro moniker without an option for a super accurate display or Quadro or Fire Pro graphics, but this is one area where they really got it right. Apple is rarely ahead of the curve on anything anymore, but even a whacked out company is right twice a decade. Somewhat surprisingly, the keyboard is quite pleasant to use with key spacing, size, and travel all proving to be excellent. But Apple, never being content with not clutching defeat from the jaws of victory, pulls some more mindless nonsense by replacing the delete key with a power button. No, I'm not joking, and that's not an edit. And to make matters worse, they've continued with this asinine tradition of mislabeling the backspace key. So what then if you need to clear text sitting in front of the cursor? Well, this can be accomplished by way of function key plus backspace. 
It took me a bit to figure out where the page up, page down, home, and end keys were, but by this logic it didn't take much to guess that it would be function plus arrow keys, and I was indeed right. Overall, it's annoying, but learnable. Also, this rubber ring around the display has the tendency to deteriorate and leave marks on both the operator's thumb and the computer's palm rest. Pointer input can make or break a portable computer. So if there's no touchscreen, no stylus input, and no pointing stick, then there had best be a good trackpad. I've outright rejected other laptops for no other reason than garbage trackpad hardware or unusable drivers. And yes, I'm looking at you, Lenovo Yoga 2 Pro. For those of you who might be new to the channel, the way I measure mouse and pointing device performance is through the original test found on mouseaccuracy.com using default settings. With a basic good quality mouse and proper settings, 17 is the magic number that I'm aiming for. A good laptop trackpad should be able to hit 16 at least, and a good pointing stick around 12 to 15. People have always hailed Apple's trackpads as being the greatest thing in portable computing, but I've been burned enough times to know better than to trust mainstream reviews. Obviously, I'll be using Windows for these tests to give it the best shot, since OS X is notorious for having some of the worst mouse acceleration known to mankind, managing to make a mockery of even the best pointing devices. For the MacBook Pro, there are really two options when it comes to Windows trackpad drivers. The first is an unofficial driver made by GitHub user Imbushuo, and the second is Apple's official driver. The unofficial driver has almost flawless pointing, and by that I mean it's every bit as good as my Dell Precision M6400's trackpad, which I consider to be, still to this day, the benchmark of good trackpads. The problem is that the Imbushuo driver has one fatal flaw, that being the registration of erroneous right clicks about 30% of the time, rendering it almost useless in practice. There does not appear to be any setting by which to disable this either, so if the author can fix the bug then I would wholeheartedly recommend his software, but until then we are stuck with Apple's driver, which quite shockingly perhaps actually isn't horrible. It's perhaps more floaty and imprecise, but as long as I keep my clicking thumb on the surface while tracking, it doesn't do anything to impede a reasonable mousing. Perhaps not ideal, but surprisingly usable. Before we dive into the topic of software, here's a quick IO tour. Since the entire lower half of the PC's case is occupied by that enormous battery pack, connectivity is surprisingly limited with just two USB 3 ports, a headphone jack, and a card reader. The headphone jack is backed up by a decently nice Surus audio chipset and offers separate audio output streams for the headphones and built-in speakers in case one wants to apply an equalizer to whatever gets hooked up. I think it can even do some kind of digital output through the connector, but didn't do much research. Speaking of audio-visual connectivity, the computer does offer HDMI output as well as not one, but two mini DisplayPort jacks which can support Thunderbolt and, surprisingly, simultaneous four monitor video output, making this one of the only computers that I own to possess such a talent. Rounding out the selection of ports, we have the infamous MagSafe 2 magnetic power connector, which usually works, but has gotten flaky with age. The power supply is nothing special. The bottom side of the computer, interestingly enough, has no ventilation holes of any kind save for these wings on the edges. As with the older model, most circulation of air appears to happen by the hinge, which I actually like because it allows the computer to sit on carpet, cloth, or similar surfaces while still retaining the ability to breathe. All right, so far we've seen a few shenanigans, but nothing obscene or insurmountable. However, keep in mind that we haven't even installed an operating system yet, so you might be wondering, at this point, what your choices are. Some brave folks have managed to install Linux on these things, but like with the G5 almost a decade before it, hardware compatibility appears to require a bit in the way of gymnastics, so you might wish to try it, but I sure won't hold your hand in the process. 
Mac OS X from Lion all the way up to Catalina 2019's release are officially supported with other versions possibly installable unofficially. Of course, if you're like me and don't have the patience for OS X's horrible mouse acceleration, Windows is obviously the only way to go. Officially, Windows 7 and Windows 8 are supported, but on a screen with this high of resolution where an interface scaling level of 200% needs to be the target, those operating systems maximum of 150% will not cut the mustard. Now, Windows 8.1 and 8 for that matter will happily install in UEFI mode, but Apple managed to royally mess up what is known as the DSDT root bridge table on this model and others from the time. This starts to run against the limitations of my knowledge, but all you really need to know is that Apple, instead of issuing a software update or, you know, actually shipping a functional product, just told everybody to use BIOS emulation mode instead of native UEFI to install Windows. In addition to having to follow this really obscure procedure for Windows to be able to properly recognize the audio chipset as well as a handful of other components, I also had to enable test mode, which normally exposes this lovely little watermark on the corner of the desktop. A freeware application called Universal Watermark Disabler fixes that, but we're sure not done yet. Getting Bluetooth to work requires extracting the installer package and fixing the setup information file so that it'll actually install for this particular chipset. And on top of all of that, I had to turn off the feature that makes Windows start to log you in before you enter your credentials as a means to save time after updates get installed. Otherwise, you'll be flying blind on every other restart. Oh, and don't click that tempting little setup.exe application because that installs conflicting versions of the graphics drivers, rendering the machine unbootable outside of safe mode. Still not convinced that Apple is totally inept yet? This computer's implementation of switchable graphics is so completely broken that even though it will recognize both video cards when booted in UEFI, despite the fact that the Intel card is hidden in BIOS emulation mode, none of the usual graphics switching mechanisms actually work. Windows's implementation doesn't recognize it at all. NVIDIA's control panel does, but seems to have no effect, and the operating system will actually completely fail to finish booting if you either disable the NVIDIA card in Device Manager or use GitHub user 0xbb's GPU switch script. One user in the bug reports section of the latter suggested that it might be a Windows 10 problem, but I didn't have any better luck with it under 8.1, so I suspect that it just doesn't work with this hardware at all, at least when using Windows, which is too bad because that massive battery could really pack a punch if only the power-hungry GeForce could just get out of the way for light web browsing and word processing tasks. Finally, the icing on the cake is that screen brightness can't be adjusted at all whatsoever from within Windows at least with UEFI. Mine happens to be stuck on Max, which I suppose is fine since the panel isn't extremely bright and the glossy screen is predictably reflective. But of all the problems I expected to have, this was the last one I thought would completely stump me. But my forum threads didn't get any response, so I presumably at least have some company. And that brings us to OS X. Some might assume that being an Apple product, there would be less hand-holding required to optimize the experience here. But those people would once again be wrong. The fundamental problem with running OS X on this machine really comes down to software compatibility. To have anything remotely resembling an acceptable mouse pointing experience, a program called Smooth Mouse needs to be used at all times to fix the acceleration curve. Smooth Mouse, however, only works with operating systems prior to 10.12. On the other hand, Apple's software development tools only target the most recent three or four versions of the operating system, and as a result, most newer software will simply refuse to run. This includes heavy hitters like Microsoft Office, the OneDrive Sync Client, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox Quantum, Firefox Quantum ESR, Remote Desktop Connection, Chrome Remote Desktop Host, and almost any other actively developed program you can think of. What makes this difficult is that it isn't always clear as to which is the newest version of any given program that is compatible with various different versions of the operating system, firstly, and secondly, where to procure those versions. 
This stands in stark contrast to most Windows programs, which tend to be compatible with basically any operating system build from the past 12 to 15 years. Between this and the fact that the OSX operating systems themselves have an increasingly narrow window of hardware support, it's becoming clear to me that Apple is trying to induce the same type of forced obsolescence that they do on iOS devices. The only reason why it isn't as bad as it is on iOS is because OS X doesn't require the user to jump through any hoops at all just to install software. With all that having been done, the machine is actually quite usable, but there is unfortunately no automatic parametric equalization available for this version of OS X like there is on Windows. The closest we can get is a manually controlled fixed band paid equalizer program. Not ideal, but it does work. I should mention that Smooth Mouse is not what I would call a perfect solution to the mousing problem either. While it does trim out about 95% of the acceleration weirdness, I can still tell that something isn't quite right when using an outboard mouse. What it completely fails at, however, is scrolling. OS X's horrible acceleration behavior does extend into how it interprets input from your pointing device's scroll wheel. Smooth Mouse unfortunately has no impact on this, and the programs that can, as you've probably guessed by now, either require a newer version of the operating system or cannot be used at the same time as Smooth Mouse. The silver lining here is that the only time I run OS X on this computer is when I'm out and about using the trackpad. And the trackpad driver does seem to mask a lot of the unnatural scrolling characteristics of the operating system. So this perhaps somewhat surprisingly isn't a total loss. In other good news, brightness controls now work and the graphics reset hang at time of boot is not present but in the interest of not leaving you in suspense any longer about whether or not the enablement of switchable graphics has any impact on battery life, well, here it is. Running Windows, the best runtime I could get with the discrete graphics only was about 90 to 120 minutes. Under OS X, with applications running almost exclusively under the integrated graphics, that enormous battery pack, even with only about two thirds of its original capacity left at this point in its life cycle, will carry the machine for a solid two to four hours of light use, meaning that the MacBook Pro can effectively be run as a pseudo ultrabook. Of course, that freedom comes with all the caveats mentioned earlier related to being confined to OS X, but some of those at least can, to some extent, be sidestepped by using remote desktop connection or, believe it or not, virtualization. With all that in mind, the only question that remains is if the MacBook Pro is capable of replacing a 15-inch full-feature laptop and an Ultrabook. If nothing else, I can definitively say that it fills the role of the former beautifully, offering unbeatable performance and battery capacity for the price. And even if it failed at being an Ultrabook, the thinness and lightness of the form factor don't hurt it at all. Four and a half pounds is on the heavy side for an Ultrabook, but not at all outside the realm of reasonableness. The 0.7 inch thickness figure not only wallops all other conventional laptops of the era, but also gives many ultra portables a run for their money. In fact, this thing is about as thick as the original Surface Pro, a machine that it outclasses and shares runtime with, although the perimeter and weight are obviously going to be different on a 10 inch computer than a 15 inch one. In fact, the only Ultrabook that it really fails to unseat is the ThinkPad X1 Carbon, which is slightly thinner and notably lighter at two and a half pounds, and the only class of full on laptops that it falls short of defeating would have to be the venerable Dell Precision M6400 with its 17 inch screen, but do consider that with all the transportation weight that is saved, it becomes possible now to bring with a portable secondary display to make up for the lack of real estate on the MacBook Pro itself. With all that said, I still really like this computer or at least wanted to like it. At the time, nothing else offered such a combination with a battery pack this large and in such a thin and light package. 
The built-in speakers on this thing are above average, and they had best be, given that a numeric keypad was obviously sacrificed in their favor. That seems to be the going trend with this computer, though. Best ever, followed by quiet profanity. If the Essential Phone was the most polarizing pocket computer I've ever owned, then the MacBook Pro from 2012 easily takes the cake for polarizing laptop computer of the year. The hardware is all here. This thing had the potential to replace both of my laptops in one fell swoop, but due to sheer ineptitude in the area of software, ultimately fails to do so. Why does it take so much effort to get 95% of the way there, with the last small hurdles being completely insurmountable? Like with the Essential PH1, this thing needs a lot of aftermarket help just to be usable, which actually gets it within an inch of the finish line, but no amount of third-party software support appears to be enough to bridge the crater of Apple's stupidity. This MacBook Pro was the only laptop computer of 2012 to possess the swagger to rock a 1610 screen in an era of 169s, the engineering might to build a full-on laptop powerhouse in the body of an ultrabook, and the sheer ineptness to make such a mockery of competent hardware that the whole experience is nothing short of a modern-day tragedy. Thanks for watching.